It's good to see everyone here this Sunday afternoon. Our first song will be number 61, 61. There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and noble, fear not I am with thee, peace be still, in love and heaven flow, Jesus, 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 sweet. sing number 266, 266. <clears throat> Wonderful story of love, tell it to me again. Wonderful story of love, when the waters rain, angels with rapture and
King David wrote in Psalms 122, verse 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go up into the house of the Lord. If you'll bow with me. Almighty God, we're so thankful for this opportunity we have again tonight to come together to renew our spirits, to edify ourselves, to edify others by our presence. We're thankful for the opportunity to focus once again on this your day, on the spiritual things of life. Fathers, we celebrate 233 years of independence in this country. We're thankful for those who fought to establish the freedoms we have, who have in the past and today continue to defend that freedom. We pray, Father, that we'll never take that freedom for granted. The democracy we have, we pray that our elected officials nationally and locally will govern by your standards of morality. Father, help us to be involved in the work, to follow the example of the Good Samaritan, that we are humble and helpful. Father, we ask a special prayer for the youth of this congregation. Help us as parents and adults to understand our responsibilities, to train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to develop future leaders so that our congregations will continue to be strong, that we'll instill the courage and integrity in our youth to stand up against the wiles of the devil, the pulls that take them away from the Lord that they face each day. Father, help us to continue our appreciation of your word. We know that you no longer speak to your people directly or through the prophets, but in the Bible we have a very small glimpse of the mind of God. We ask that you be with those that are traveling home this weekend or on vacation. You watch over them, bless them. We ask you bless those that are physically ill. Father, we especially ask that you watch over those of this congregation who are spiritually ill. We pray that they'll return to the fold, that their spirits will be strengthened anew. And Father, as we enter this new year of independence, we pray that you'll bless us as we attempt to glorify you in all that we say, do, and think. Father, forgive us where we fall short. Bless us as we serve you daily. We ask this in your son's holy name. Amen. Number 590-590. You'll have to use your books, 590. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. 
Shadows dispelling with joy, I'm telling he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Light to mark number 119, 119, that'll be the song of invitation at the conclusion of our lesson this evening. And before our lesson, let's stand and sing number 80, number 80, and we'll sing all five verses. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus of Nazarene and wondered how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden 
turning in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. We want to look at one particular verse out of that chapter as a basis of our study together this evening, Hebrews chapter 11. It is good to see each of you here this evening. We do have a good crowd assembled for our Sunday evening. We do have visitors in our presence, and we are delighted that you are here. We do have uh, several who are away from us, as has been announced, who are in a couple of different areas of mission work uh, this week and part of next week, and we certainly want to remember them in our prayers while they are away from us doing that good work. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, is where we want to focus our attention for this evening. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. One does not have to look very far to realize the difficulty that faces the home as God would have it. If some people had their way, the home would no longer be recognizable. There's so many different areas where people are talking about alternate lifestyles, where they're talking about a new dimension as far as marriage and the home is concerned. There is a great deal of discussion even among some of our brethren with regard to marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And all of those things combined help us to see that there is a major problem in the homes in our country. I heard something, I assume it was a joke, it sounds like one, but I guess it could be real, about the young lady who put in an ad in the local paper advertising for a husband. She got a hundred responses. Three of them were from men who said, we are looking for a wife and ready to marry. The other 97 were from women who said, you can have my husband. That just illustrates, I guess in a way, the problem areas that we do face. When we realize that there are these problem areas, we then immediately need to turn our attention to a solution to that problem. If it is a problem that is something contrary to the Word of God, there is a solution to that problem within the Word of God. And I believe that Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 holds some keys to the solution to that problem. When you think about the problems and the vital ingredients that are involved in that, obviously one of them is faith. That's what we read about throughout chapter 11. By faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, others along the way. And in each of these cases, you look at situations where men were focused on the will of God, where men had turned to God and His way. When you think about, for example, Joshua, children would be in a good home if they had fathers like Joshua, would they not? Here was a man who said, you choose whatever you want to choose, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Or you think about men like Cornelius, who sent for one who could tell him words whereby he could be saved, and he had not only his own family, but others, gathered together to hear exactly what God had to say about the matter. His faith was demonstrated in that regard. In Acts chapter 16, verses 31 to 34, we have at least a part of the story of the Philippian jailer. Here was a man, when he heard what he needed to do, respected that word, and especially In verse 34 of that chapter, we have a demonstration of his faith. 
That is exactly what we have in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7 with regard to Noah. But I want us to notice several aspects of this verse that help us understand some of the solution to the problem of our home life, making things better, making things more in harmony with what God has said about the matter. The very first thing that you notice is, by faith, Noah. In spite of those around him, Noah was a man who found grace or favor in the sight of God. Here was one who, in spite of those around him, chose a way of life that was contrary to those round about him. It can be easily observed that anybody else during that time period, during his day, could have done exactly what Noah did. He didn't have exclusive right to the Word of God. As a matter of fact, during his lifetime, during the preparing of that ark, there was the preaching of righteousness being done according to statements made by Peter. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So others had access to the Word of God. Others could have chosen to have followed the Word of God. But Noah did what God wanted him to do. In Genesis chapter 6, we find the story of the wickedness that was present on the earth at that time. Every thought and imagination of man's heart was evil continually. As a result of the sins that existed in that day, God, being displeased with that, decided that he was going to destroy the world with a flood, and he did. But in the process of time, as a result of Noah finding grace in the eyes of the Lord, was given instruction by God to build an ark to the saving of his house. Now, immediately, we have faith and family tied together, don't we? This was not something that related just to Noah, but it related to his family as well. Prepare an ark. He was given specific instructions as to how that ark was to be built. Verse 14, beginning of Genesis chapter 6. But then when you come down to verse 22 of that chapter, we find that Noah did all according as God had commanded him. That tells us of his faith. So if God told him what to do in verses 14 and following, and he did that according to verse 22 of that chapter, then you could understand why the Hebrews writer would say, By faith Noah. You and I are well aware that faith comes by hearing the word of God. Noah heard the word of God, not just hearing it as in it went in his ears but he heard it in the fact that he respected what God had to say. And then when you come into chapter 7 and in verse 1, God instructs Noah and his family to enter that ark. So Noah, by faith, did what God had instructed him to do. And of course, it's interesting in that regard that some people would have us believe that faith is a gift of God. For example, when we talk about Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. In that context, Paul's talking about salvation. But there are those who would say to us that, that that suggests that faith is a gift from God. Well, if that's the case, think about another verse right here in Hebrews chapter 11, the preceding verse, 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. If faith is a gift from God, I don't have that faith. I can't please God. It is God's fault, not mine, that I'm not pleasing to God. That's the consequence of that particular idea. God has provided a gift, salvation. 
He has told us about that salvation in His Word. As we read and study that Word, faith is created within us relative to God, to Christ, His only begotten Son, and the plan that enables us to enjoy salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. Same principle is involved in Genesis chapter 6. God had obviously spoken, and Noah listened to what God had to say and did exactly what God had commanded of him. Now, whenever you think about Noah's wife and his children, they have every assurance of what he is doing because God says, do it. Now, you think about that as it relates to family life today. If every father and every husband would listen to God and do what God says do, whether it is in the matter of becoming a child of God or living the Christian life that God commands of us, his wife and his children would have every assurance because he is doing exactly what God says do. Now, if a man's not doing what God says do, either in becoming a Christian or living the Christian life, then his wife and his children can have absolutely no confidence in what he's doing because he's following his own will, he's following his own desires, he's following his own lust as opposed to following the will of God. So, why does a father attend services? Because that's what God says. Why does a father discipline his children? Because that's what God says. And on and on and on the list could go. His faith in God is demonstrated by the way he lives his life. That ought to be the desire. That ought to be the aim. That ought to be the the goal. That ought to be the response of every man alive. Listen to what God says. And by your very life, demonstrate your faith in God by doing what God calls upon you to do. Every one of us ought to respond to God in that way. So when you begin looking at Hebrews 11 and verse 7, you find Noah's faith. By faith, Noah. And so faith and family are tied together. Then the verse continues to say, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. Moved with fear. So not only does this verse tell us of Noah's faith, it tells us of his fear. And again, fear and family are tied together in this verse. This idea of fear is holy regard and respect for what God says. God's will must be supreme in my life. God's will must be supreme in the life of every man who is a father, who is a husband, who is trying to direct his family to be with God eternally when this life is over. There must be a regard and a respect for God's will. Back in Hebrews chapter 5, And in verse 7, there is reference made, and this is in the context of of Christ and the fact that He's the Son of God. The Hebrews writer said, Who in the days of His flesh, when He had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto Him that was able to save Him from death, was heard in that He feared. There's the idea of fear again that holy regard and respect for the will of the Father. This, of course, was said of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. As you go back to chapter 6 of Genesis, after God had given specific instruction as to how that ark was to be constructed, Noah was careful in building that ark. Several years ago, I was teaching a class based on the idea of of instruction given by God and 
uh, really based on a, on a book that was written in that regard. But in the course of the class, I requested of the class, I want you to draw a picture of the ark to scale based on the description that we have in Genesis chapter 6. It was interesting how some people drew that ark. It was obvious the first place some people didn't know how to draw by scale. That didn't surprise me so much. But what did surprise me was the fact that certain aspects of what was said in Genesis chapter 6 was ignored. What would happen, what would have happened to Noah and his family had Noah not had a holy regard and respect for the Word of God in building that ark? The ark would not have floated. Noah and his family would have been lost. But because of his care in the building of that ark, according to the details given by God, he and his family were able to be saved. So he didn't have a flippant attitude. He didn't have a lack of concern attitude for the will of God. And yet we see that so often today, don't we? How often do people have little regard for what God says about any matter? That's why there are so many different religious organizations in the world in which you and I live. Simply because people do not have regard for the details of the Word of God. They, they believe that God is to be worshipped. But they have no regard for the details because they ignore the details. God has told us how He wants to be worshipped. We have no right to worship in any other way. We mentioned a moment ago the, the matter of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I don't believe there is anything in all of God's Word any plainer than Matthew 5 and verse 32, Matthew 19 and 9. And yet it is amazing how many volumes have been written with regard to the matter of marriage, divorce, and remarriage trying to get around exactly what God has said about the matter. What's the problem? People have a lack of regard, lack of respect for the will of God in that matter, to the details of it. When it comes to the organization of the church, look around at the various religious organizations, sad to say, even among some of our brethren, who are now allowing women to have roles in the Lord's church that God never authorized. What's the problem? Lack of respect and regard for the details of God's Word. But when we come to Hebrews eleven seven. 7, we learn that not only did Noah have faith, but Noah had fear. He had regard, he had respect for the details of what God had said with regard to the building of the ark. Every man today who is going to be a father or a husband, if he understands the importance of his place in his family, will have a proper regard for the detail of the Word of God. That will solve a lot of our problems in the home. Then you notice as well, in that same verse, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. So not only in this verse do we see Noah's faith, do we see Noah's fear, but we also see Noah's foresight in preparing that ark. God said, I'm going to destroy this world with a flood. Noah, one of these days, it's going to begin to rain and it's not going to stop until this world is flooded. Suppose Noah had said, well, you know, I really believe what God says about it, but I don't know what rain is, number one. I've never seen it, number two. I'm not sure that it's going to happen, so I'm going to wait. And if and when it does start raining, I'm going to get busy and build an ark. That wasn't the position that he took, was it? He didn't know when it was going to begin to rain. He prepared an ark to the saving of his house. So here, faith, fear, and foresight 
had to do with his family and the influence that he had on his family in that regard. Well, you can think about a lot of other characters along those lines. Think about Timothy and the influence that his mother and grandmother had on him because of their faith, because of their fear, because of their foresight. They didn't wait until Timothy became an adult before they began to instruct him in the word of the Lord. Paul says that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. They had foresight in training him, bringing him up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You think about John the Baptist, parents, Zacharias, and Elizabeth. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 and 6 gives us a very vivid description of those parents. The respect that they had in doing what God commanded them to do. An influence that they had on John and the work that he had to do in this life. Read through the Proverbs. See how many references there are to the influence of family, influence of parents on their children. Chapter 1 and verse 8 basically presents the, the concept of a child at his mother's knee. And the instruction is, don't forget the instruction, the counsel of thy mother. In chapter 1 and verse 10, you have counsel to children as to the kind of companions that they are to select in this life. Children would listen to that. And if we would instill these things in our young people of today in the home, think of the influence it could have. I think it's one of the saddest days in the history of any Christian when they began to blame the church for the spiritual failure of their children. Now the church can do a lot to supplement what the family does. I don't deny that. But the church cannot take the place of the responsibility of father and mother in the bringing of those children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And yet I've heard folks sit around in, in meetings with elders and blame the elders because their children have gone astray. The problem is in the home, not in the church, for the most part. Now I realize that sometimes the church can play a big part in taking children astray if they allow things to go on that ought not. But that's generally not the case. Chapter 4 of the Proverbs, verses 23 through 26, there is really detailed example given of, of how we are to live our lives. It begins with the heart. We would heed that advice. It would nullify what the writer talks about in chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, and those things that God hates. We'd get our hearts right our homes are right, then those things will not be present. Then you come down to chapter 31, and probably every woman in here knows what Proverbs 31 is all about. Virtuous woman. Who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. Well, how do you develop that virtuous woman? By the principles that are found throughout the Proverbs up to that point. But you know, Job 31 presents a virtuous man. In Job himself, there are several characteristics of Job. And I've often said, matter of fact, I've preached this before. If we could get that man of Job 31 and that woman of Proverbs 31 together as husband and wife, what a family that would be. But you see, that's what's lacking. That's why there's so many problems in the homes today. Either the man of Job 31 or the woman of Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 31 is missing in the home. That's why we need more of what God's Word has to say in that regard. So you put them together and the child bring a child into the world and rear him with the principles of Proverbs. What kind of a person would he turn out to be? That's what faith and fear and foresight will do. How many generations is it going to take to break that chain? Just one. We have record of that in the history of the nation of Israel. One generation forgot God. Now they no longer exist as a nation. And I believe in a large part that explains why we are 
in our country today how we are and explains how we got there. Lack of the kind of teaching that is found in Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 7. But then notice another thing in this verse. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. So you have his faith, you have his fear, you have his foresight, now you have his family. You have the salvation of his family to the saving of his family. But what brought that about? What brought that about? That's what you have next. By which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. His faithfulness is what brought about the salvation of his family in that regard. Faith in spite of an alien world. We think we live in a bad world, and we do. But I suggest it's not as bad as the world of Noah's day. And yet Noah was a man of righteousness, a preacher of righteousness, a man of faith, a man of fear, a man of foresight, and there's absolutely no reason why any man who would desire to be so cannot pattern their life after Noah's life today. That'll lead to faithfulness. Faithfulness to God's Word. Anyone in that day could have been like Noah. He had the same pressures. He had the same difficulties that everybody else in that day had. Probably even more when he started building that ark. See, my situation, your situation, is not unique. I believe that is exactly the problem that Paul discusses in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and in verse 12 and 13 when he said, Let a man, if a man thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. He talks about the fact that God's not going to allow you to be tempted above your able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. My temptations, my sins, my difficulties in life are not unique to me. And if you go back and study that context, Paul is dealing with the matter of idolatry. Could it be the point of idolatry there is I have become an idol to myself. If I think my situation is so different, if I think my situation is so unique and, and as a result of that God needs to deal, me, deal with me in a different way, in a unique way than He deals with everybody else, have I made myself an idol in that regard? I believe that's kind of what Paul is discussing in that chapter. Our situations are not unique. Noah's situation was not unique. He was tried. The company that he had to keep, the interest that he had, we all face similar things in life in that regard. But because of his faith, because of his fear, because of his foresight, because of his faithfulness, he was able to save his family. But then there's a final point in this verse. He became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. There's Noah's future. His future became heir of righteousness. Do you find anybody else in Genesis chapter 6? whose name lives on like Noah's name does. No. You don't find anybody else named in that chapter. Whose name continues on. Because of his faith, fear, foresight, look at what a future he has. Not only his future, but he ensured the future of his family in the same way. Wouldn't those be things worthy of consideration for every man today, every father, every husband, in thinking about your family and the responsibility you have in that family? Did it cost Noah? You know, there may have been times we can only speculate at the ridicule that he must have taken on a daily basis 
while he was building that ark, preparing for a flood, getting ready for something that had not yet been seen even, the ridicule he must have taken. Do you think maybe at some point Noah might have thought, do you really think this is worth it? <laughs> is it really worth it? Is it costing too much? But then you think about another aspect of that. Noah, his family, chapter 7 and verse 1, are now invited into the ark. God closed the door. When it began to rain and the waters began to rise, what do you think Noah's family might have said to him at that point? Think about that. What would his family maybe, maybe have said? But in that regard, as fathers, as husbands, as those responsible for the leadership in our families, whenever eternity begins, what will our families be able to say to us? Thank you for your faith. Thank you for your respect for God's Word. Thank you for the foresight in preparing us for this occasion. Or will our families have to say to us, Why did you not believe God? Why did you not take God at His Word? Why did you not have the foresight to prepare us for the judgment and an eternity? What will our families be able to say to us? Men in this audience, if you're not a child of God tonight, you need to think about your responsibility in that regard. Where is your faith? Where is your respect for God's Word in, in doing what God has told you to do to become His child? Where is your foresight in accepting the responsibility of leadership in preparing your family for eternal salvation? As a man in this audience who has been baptized into Christ, are you accepting the responsibility that Noah accepted for his family? Where is your faith? Where is your fear? Where is your foresight? Where is your faithfulness? Not only that will lead to your salvation, but will lead to the salvation of your family when this life is over. If it's not what it ought to be, why don't you ask God to forgive you? And then when that day of judgment comes, your family can be as proud of you as no doubt Noah's family was proud of him for his faith, his fear, his foresight, and his faithfulness that led to a brighter future than what everybody else in the world of that day had to look forward to when it began to rain. If you're not prepared to meet God, why don't you prepare tonight? We stand together and sing this song.
thanks to Sydney for those excellent lessons today for all others who had a public part in our worship service. For those that are visiting, we're certainly glad you've decided to be with us. Please, please take a moment, fill out an attendance card if you were not here this morning. Leave that on the table in the foyer as you depart so that we may have a record of your visit here with us. Again, I'll remind you of those on our prayer list. Joyce Presley is having upcoming foot surgery on July the 21st. You're asked to continue to remember Richard Wheeler, Pam Wilkes as she awaits her test results, Claude Bearden as he has begun his treatment, Wayne Coffin, Gail Woody's brother who's not doing well, also friends and family of Joan Thurman, her passing of her brother-in-law's brother, Frank Martin, and also family friend Clyde Crocker. Tammy Hall, the friend of Ann White. You're also asked to uh, keep in prayer uh, Jan and Caitlin Adams. Kelly Patterson is there on a mission trip to Panama, and also Rebecca Gray, as she left Thursday to go on a mission trip to Ireland, she and her fiance and several others from Montgomery. Concerning Rebecca Gray, she did place membership with us here at Bremen last Wednesday night, so we're proud to have her. We also are pleased to announce, if you were not here and did not hear this morning, we have a new brother in Christ, Todd Spake, who was baptized into Christ last week. Our Vacation Bible School begins next Sunday. Believe it or not, we'll have our balloon lift off and our ice cream supper next Sunday evening after the evening service. That's July 13 through 17. We'll have classes for all ages, even in the auditorium. We'll have adult classes in the auditorium each night. Each service will begin at 7 p.m. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday will be our awards and pizza party for all that have participated. Concerning VBS and those who wish to help and begin to prepare their classrooms, Next Sunday afternoon after the morning service, once everybody's gotten them something to eat, if you want to come back to the building, start preparing your classrooms. The building will be open. If you wish to do that, that will be next Sunday afternoon. All afternoon, the building will be open for those who wish to work in uh, preparing their lessons, gathering their work lesson plans, and decorating their classrooms. The building will be open next Sunday afternoon for just that. Brothers Keepers Group 1 meets next Saturday, July the 11th at 6 o'clock at the house next door. Bring your favorite ice cream topping or dessert. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer for that event. There's also a rafting trip that's been planned for ages 12 and up. That will be August the 1st. I assume that's on a Saturday, right, Johnny? Saturday, I do believe. And there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer here. I'm sorry, in the hallway. If you wish to go, please sign up. 45 bucks plus a little bit of money for food. Bring that with you, sign up, and see Johnny for more detail. Uh, he asks that you do have that registration money to him by July 15. After services, we got two meetings, well, really one. The Golden Age Banquet, those that are helping prepare for the Golden Age Banquet, you're asked to have a brief planning meeting tonight. And if you would, wait for the Lord's Supper to conclude. We'll have that in the fellowship hall. If uh, you're helping staff and so forth for the Golden Age Banquet, please meet in the Fellowship Hall immediately after services for a brief meeting concerning that event. Also, tonight, beginning at 7.30, we will be showing the gospel meeting that's being held by Gospel Broadcasting Network on the screen here behind me. That will be tonight, beginning at 7.30. Brother Glenn Colley speaks concerning the family, and we'll also be showing that event next or tomorrow, Monday and Tuesday, 7.30 each evening. So if you wish to come and see it on the big screen, we will have it available for you. Uh, tomorrow night, Brother B.J. Clark speaks, and then again Wednesday night, Glenn Colley will speak again. But that is the nationwide gospel meeting that begins today, 7.30 tonight. Now, if you're not able to come to the building and you still want to see it, it is broadcast live on high-speed internet, gbntv.org. You can watch it at any time certainly GBN, but the gospel meeting will be broadcast live 7.30 beginning tonight, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to take it. Once we stand to sing, go through this door, second door on the right, down the hall, there will be someone there waiting to serve you. Again, our next service officially is Wednesday night at 7 p.m. when our, gospel, our uh, summer series continues. Who's our speaker? 
Tommy Tidwell from South Cobb is our speaker next Wednesday night, and you'll certainly want to be here to participate in that. Should we mention anything else? Final song. 553 five, is our final song. If you'll stand, we'll sing and be dismissed. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus, take this heart. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of this worship here today. Dear Lord, we're thankful for the lessons that have been taught here. Dear Lord, we thank you for the privilege of hearing those lessons, and we thank you for your word that teaches us how to live our lives. Dear Lord, we ask that you be with each one of us in the upcoming week. May we stand fast in your word. May we always teach the truth and be the examples that we should be. In Christ's name, amen.